Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting-edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. In the United States, there's a growing concern about the rise in racism under a Trump administration that has a strategy of attacking immigrants, the majority of whom are Mexican, and Mexico itself. Some 38 million people of Mexican origin live in the United States. It's a huge population that maintains customs, language, and ties to Mexico, but there's a large number of misconceptions between the two Mexicos the diaspora, and the part of the population that lives within the borders of the country. To talk about those misconceptions, to talk about the Chicano movement in the United States and the current moment, we're very pleased to have with us here in the studio, David Maciel. David, thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. David is an emeritus professor at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, has also been a professor here at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and many other places. He's a doctor in history and has dedicated his life, not just his academic career, but also as an activist and an advocate to the Chicano movement. David, it's really an honor to have you here. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for, the, for this invitation. And we're very pleased to see that you brought out these two new books that you've mm. been presenting here in uh -huh. Mexico, The Other Face of Mexico, which is a collection of your essays, and The Creation of the Chicano Nation, an mm -hmm. anthology that basically chronicles the history of the Chicano movement in the United States. What was the point of putting out these books in Spanish mm -hmm. at this time? Well, the what we have been very concerned about in the U.S. is that Mexico has had very little information, very little attention, very little uh, curiosity about the Mexican origin population in the U.S. Along with, you were mentioning misconceptions, there's still a lot of ideas erroneously that, for example, we're a working class community, which that's no longer the case. Um, it's that, all classes. That Yes, I mean, we have an elite class, we have a large middle class, we have a university class that's growing immensely. Um, we have sectors of, of uh, major entrepreneurs. We have academics that are from Prince teaching at universities like Princeton to Berkeley. So, I mean, this community is not known whatsoever in Mexico. So I have found that very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. And that was my main purpose in publishing these two books in Mexico to begin to um, fill this gap um, of understanding of knowledge about the Mexican origin community, the Chicano uh, community as we call it. Well, it's certainly true that there is a lack of knowledge and even at times some hostility, to be yes, honest about it, sure. between these communities. And you certainly notice it here in Mexico. The anthology is called The Creation of the Chicano Nation. Let's start with the definition of terms. <laughs> yes. How do you define Chicano? Chicanos. Well, you know, the term Chicano is not particularly new. Uh, according to linguists and historians, it was around from late 19th century, and it was a term of camaraderie of, of working class people that, that used that as a, as a diminutive of Mexicano, Chicano, Mexicano kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. I'm not a linguist and I'm not, you know, a historian of language, but that's, you know, I rely on my colleagues for that. And then the term sort of, you know, disappeared or, or you know, fell out of usage until the 1960s, when, as you know, in the 1960s, these great waves of social unrest occurred in the United States with incredible social movements. That was, you know, the Afro-American movement, which had roots, you know, much prior to the 60s, the feminist movement, the Native American movement, the student movement, and then, of course, the Chicano movement. And Chicanos, when they started the social movement, wanted a, an autonomous term, a term of the community, not Mexican-American, which was the most common term, but they saw Mexican-American as a term imposed by the dominant society, that is, the label by the dominant society. So I wanted a term out of the community. So they, I have no idea who chose the term okay. Chicano movement uh, for our social movement, but, you know, it, 
it caught fire and um, you know it was a movement that changed every aspect of the Chicano community. In terms of creating an identity because talking about that hostility I mean to some part of the U.S. public and to some part of the Mexico public Chicano means not us. Yes well you know um, what you have, uh, you know, we're getting into questions of identity. Yeah. Identity, as you know, is a very complex phenomena. And what, what we have are two poles. One pole, say, lo mexicano, and one pole, lo norteamericano. Within that two poles is a wide gamut. You find Chicanos all the way from one extreme to the other, and most Chicanos are somewhere in the middle. Um, but um, Chicano embodied ethnic consciousness, ethnic pride, in being of Mexican origin. Because and it was a collective term. Yes, a collective yeah. term. And as you know, we face tremendous discrimination throughout our history in the United States and racism and violence and, you know, uh, dispossession of our, our lands and to our date. goods. And we lost everything in the 19th century. The majority, I mean, there were some elites that were able to maintain uh, their privileges, but the majority of us lost everything. Mm -hmm. And, w you know, we were a working class community until the 1960s when institutions were forced because of the movement, because of affirmative action, which may, maybe I should say a couple of words about what affirmative action is because it, it's not well known in Mexico. Yeah, and it's critical to And the it's movement. critical because it forced by law institutions to open up and include minorities in their admissions policies, in their um, uh, uh, process of hiring, and so the, the, the curriculum. The as curriculum well. and also courses on the Chicano uh, community, which were non-existent before that. So everything changed because of the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 70s. The book is also called The Chicano Nation. Yes. What's a Chicano Nation? Well, you know, we're, we're sort of um, wishful thinking to some degree of, of that title, but I like that title. I, I happen to be the w one of the three call editors that picked that title, w maybe ambitious because we're growing so much. I mean, we're almost, you know, 40 million today, and demographers state that by 2050, one out of every four persons in the United States will be of Latino origin and almost 64% of Mexican origin. So that's why I sort of jumped the gun a little bit and said and called it the Chicano Nation. Maybe we're not a nation yet, but we are the largest most numerous ethnic minority in the United States and the fastest growing minority in the United States. And many believe that this is precisely the huge fear of the white supremacists and the government of Donald Trump who represents them. Absolutely. I, I, I'm being very surprised that there is of course so much coverage on Donald Trump here and so many editorials and so forth, but there's one gap that's missing. I, which explains a great deal about why Trump came into power, precisely white supremacy. Mm -hmm. they, he is there above all other factors to minimize the Latin Americanization of the United States. One of his bla banners that did not get the coverage here that it should have, you know, the one banner that everybody talked about was Make America Great which of course Hillary Clinton said, that's garbage, America's always been great. What the hell is this, you know? But the second banner did not get nearly as much notice, which said, make America white again. They actually had signs like that in the rallies. All over in his, ki in his, in his rallies. Hmm. And he stated. Then they so build the wall. And, and it's all part of that agenda. They cannot stop the Latin Americanization, but they want to minimize it. Because it's not just the numbers that they're scared to death, but it's the spaces that we're gaining. For every space, like say a professional space, like, like a doctor, or lawyer, or a professor, it's one space less that they have. And that's what they're so afraid of. As you know, we have great politicians today. We have terrific academics. You know, I mean, these two books are, are you know, just samples of the, you know, in this of collections of essays of various academics. We have professors that are teaching from Princeton University to Berkeley that are Chicanos or Chicanas. Um, and so, you know, it's a different community that, again, going back to stereotypes and misperceptions, that those realisms are not known here in Mexico. The, uh, the changes uh, in our community today. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the diversity within, yes. the, within the community itself on all levels, with classes mm -hmm. and sectors yes. in which it's involved. Will those demographics come up in the discussions on the rise of Donald Trump from time to time? But it is noteworthy the degree to which people still back off from calling it a white supremacist government mm -hmm. and understanding the role that especially the reaction against Latinos yes, plays. it is the backlash, as you, as you were mentioning a few minutes ago. It is a backlash because they see it all around them. You know, there is no region of the United States from New York to Alaska. You know, there are over 5,000 persons of Mexican origin residing in Alaska. Who would have ever thought <laughs> of Mexicans, of Chicanos in Alaska? We're everywhere, from Alaska to New York. We are a national minority, no longer a regional minority. You know, we're always associated with the Southwest. And of course, over half, a little over half of the Chicanos still reside in California and Texas. But the other half are, are everywhere. Everywhere, North Carolina, Arkansas, uh, New Orleans, you know, New York. Um, and that's a big part of the message too, which actually could be an important mm -hmm. message to Trump supporters in the sense of the degree of integration of the Mexican population, which is not the same as assimilation, mm -hmm. but integration mm -hmm. into all levels of the mm -hmm. U.S. population, where in most all communities, you see people living harmoniously and productively mm -hmm. side by side, very different from this image that the Trump administration is giving. From your studies, well, what, kind what, of what I see is that, that Trump and his followers have really polarized the United States yeah. into two visions of the country, of where the country is and where it should be going. One vision is, of course, the one that we advocate of a country that embraces diversity, that heralds <laughs> diversity, and that it is how it's been in past decades to some degree and that diversity has made the United States great. And so, you know, we think that being bilingual, being bicultural should be the model to follow. Mm -hmm. And my students see that pragmatically because, for example, I was just talking to a, a graduate student in medicine who uh, I was curious why she was taking a course on Mexican cinema. And I asked her, what are you doing in this class? I'm curious. She said, Professor, I'm going to be a surgeon, but I'm going to reside here in Los Angeles. Who are going to be my patients? Latinos. I should know more about my culture. I should perfect my language because I'm going to be dealing with Latinos. So it's no longer a cultural issue or a spiritual issue, but a pragmatic issue that that's where the country is going. That's one vision of the country. The other vision, of course, is Trump and his people that one to go back to centuries, not just decades, where the white man, and usually it's male, Protestant, you know, uh, dominated everything. And kept After killing the indigenous people. And, and quote unquote, kept minorities in their place. Yeah. But we've broken out of our place. Yeah. And, that's and your what place is becoming beca yes. larger than well, it is. It's yes. becoming the whole nation. I mean. Yes, but they wanted to keep us everyone's. as working class with no political representation. Yeah. But that's out. That's gone. Yeah. So these two visions of the country are in war to the death. And what will emerge or it's what will be victorious. Violent. Yes, it is violent and is racist. Hate crimes. Look at hate crimes and racism, you know, was really diminished before Trump because everybody kept talking about politically correct. That's out the window because these guys, you know. Have made hate of course, politically and correct. They, they're racist all over the place and they use racist terms and so forth. So these visions are clashing, you know, and it's a war to the death, I see it. It's yeah. cultural wars, you know, and it will determine the fate and the future of the United States. How do you think with these books that uh, giving each population more information, the Mexican population mm -hmm. here about migrants in the United States and vice versa, more understanding, more empathy toward each other will help confront the white supremacist model of Donald Trump? Well, I don't think we can do much about those people, but what I think we could do a lot is that we have so much to offer the two Mexican communities which we haven't done much. We of can a, make each other stronger. Yes, 
I mean, in every field, culture, economics, politics, and so forth. Um, for example, it, it is inconceivable to me that at this point in time, there is no university in Mexico, none from Tijuana to Chiapas, that has a program, even a course, on the Mexican origin population in the United States. Not one. Really? Not one. That shocks me. It, it is shocking. And there's not a specialist, I mean, a bona fide academic specialist on our community in Mexico. So I'm hoping that these books will spur interest, will spur universities like the National University of Mexico, which is the logical one, but also, you know, the Colegio de Mexico, CIDE, La Iberoamericana, and so forth, to begin thinking about the importance of our community. As you know, the money that we sent to Mexico is the number one source of income. It's surpassed oil, but it yeah. goes beyond the monies that we send. We have so many, as you know, if you were to be in a room and you ask for a show of hands, how many people in Mexico have family over there? I, I bet you over 90% would raise their hands and vice versa. So we have family yeah. ties, we have cultural ties, we have social ties, we have economic ties. And now I'm hoping that we begin to establish academic and educational ties. That would be <laughs> more than reasonable. Yes. And, I think it, this and it is would the be beneficial to, to both communities. Yeah, yeah, I am very surprised that it's not having to happening to a greater degree. In this book where you chronicled the Chicano movement, the movement, like any movement, has had ebbs and flows mm -hmm. and points of strength and greater weaknesses. How do you assess it today? Well, the movement changed, you know, the, the euphoria, the activism of the 60s and 70s diminished, but the cause didn't diminish. What it did was it institutionalized itself mm -hmm. through organizations and through lobbies and through organizations such as the National Council of La Raza, such as MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Aid Association, such as LULAC, and then local and state organizations. That was one part. Then movements such as the Dreamers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, go, they put their lives on the line because they're out there on the streets demonstrating, knocking on doors, demanding that they be legalized and that they're finally passed, you know, a comprehensive immigration law, which Congress hasn't done for over 20 years. So anyway, uh, it, it, besides the dreamers, it, the cause is different. It's within the system, within institutions, and it's on various planes, politics mostly, but also social um, issues and educational issues. And continues to be in the streets. Yes, to some degree, to but some not degree as well. like the 60s, which no. were the highlight of, of activism you know, on the streets. But the movement, we don't call it the Chicano movement anymore. We sort of call it La Causa, or we call it, you know, the... the, the Immigration the, rights movement, yes, depending I on mean, different issues Yes, on the specific well. ones. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. you know, educational um, uh, programs and achievements and pressures to universities to continue funding students and, and scholarships and so forth. And courses, I mean, we've established now courses on Chicano themes, again, from Princeton, we have a terrific Chicana historian teaching at Princeton, brand new, who had mm -hmm. a, speaking of books, she just published a dynamite book entitled An American Language, A History of Spanish in the United States. Cool. And it won her a position at Princeton University. Mm -hmm. So we have all, you know, those kinds of academic, new academics. And you, you'll be interested in this. The majority of new academics are women. Much more women are coming out of the academy than men. And that changes the movement. Yes, it does. Diversifies. Yes. And, and, and there are more women students today at the university than uh -huh. men. Do you think the Trump presidency would prove to be a catalyst for it? It has, you know, um, as you know, there's this good saying in Spanish that says, no hay mal que por bien no venga, you know? <laughs> and I think Trump is doing some of that. It's uniting people. People voted in the last elections. Look, we took over the House of Representatives because of record numbers. All. To, to a large degree, derivative because of, of Trump and his hate policies that people said, I got to vote against this guy and, and his And within policies. the Democrats, there's a far greater degree of yes, diversity and unity in Congress as oh, well. 24 new Latinos and Latinas yeah. came into Congress, as you know. Do you, you think know. that they will 
they will work together to to unquestionably i mean they're already given you know uh trump an enormous headache yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. It's There's the, you know, they're, they're uh, finding him in the courts at almost every level, at every state, yeah. at every initiative. That he, I mean, he'll never get this damn wall. You know, the Democrats now, you know, have the House of Representatives. They won't fund it. What do you anticipate to be the tipping point battles in the next year, the remainder of the Trump administration? Well, again, po polit you know, political representation against, you know, educational opportunities and labor and immigration. Immigration will be at the forefront. He's made immigration his key, yeah. you know, agenda. Well, we're going to have an opposite view of immigration. Make it to the key point of the agenda yes. mm -hmm. ag against, against it. Turn it. In defense, turn it. More, more than against, and, it's in defense. and also to showcase the contributions of immigrants to the yeah. American economy. What would the American economy be without immigrants? Who would be out picking in the fields? You think most North Americans would go out and pick from sun up to sundown? It's pretty proven uh, that they won't. Of course, they'll go to a McDonald's any day. I would do the same. <laughs> so who is going to be the workers in agricultural fields? Only people that have no other choices, that, those being indocumentados. Yeah, yeah. There's some pretty serious contradictions. And they're also the and babysitters, and they're also the service workers. The you go to any hotel, as you know, in the States, all you hear is Spanish because mm -hmm. all you know, the workers in the hotel are yeah. Latino. Yeah. Well, David, we've come mm. to the end of the program mm. very quickly. Mm. Yes. And uh, I hope we get a chance to continue discussing these issues in the near future. Thanks so much for joining Surely. us. Surely. Do invite me again, and we'll be happy to continue this conversation. Great. Thanks. Uh-huh. And thank you. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico.